back uh, this here and get things started. Oh, Play slideshow. I think we're good. Again, John Fine from UCSF. I will. I can speak very loudly. I don't even tend to need a microphone at a conference. Um, uh, Dr. Lipnick asked me to summarize some of the statistics. Not everyone um, reads pulse oximeter studies. I know we have a lot of differences in background. Um, I've been doing the statistics for our studies, both uh, reporting for various manufacturers we study and. Um, for our studies, not uh, the statistical nerd, and we're going to get to hear from other statistical nerds after me. I enjoy hanging out uh, with them. Um, I wanted to describe a lot of the essential statistics. You've heard a lot of these, and not everyone is familiar with this. Um, first of all, bias, which is also called error. One of the things I want to emphasize here it is the SpO2 minus the arterial oxygen saturation. Start my video. Yes, I didn't have a chance to get my makeup on this morning, but hopefully uh, the video is not too disturbing. Um, oh, you'll see literature that actually has the bias backwards, so it's very important to look in there. There are people reporting negative biases because they have it backwards, and this is important. What do we mean by bias? A positive bias, and again, we've been discussing this in dark-skinned individuals. A positive bias means the device reads too high, uh, which means, of course, it can. Uh, then not detect hypoxemia. Accuracy is usually the mean bias. Um, precision is the standard deviation of the bias. Root mean square error, accuracy root mean square error. I like to describe this as the overall performance standard. Uh, it has been mentioned previously. I included the mathematical definition. It includes components of both the standard accuracy and the precision. If either the accuracy or precision are poor, the root mean square error will be poor. The limits of agreement represents the distribu distribution of the data, which is what, where 95% of the expected data is, and that's 1.96 times the standard deviation. Okay. However, it's important to note uh, there is an adjustment for repeated measures uh, published by Bland and Altman, which inflates this a little bit and is required uh, for the FDA report, um, and that is what is usually reported. button down there. Okay. And this is the type of table that uh, I uh, supply to manufacturers. Again, it's reported over different ranges of oxygen saturation. The FDA requires that we distribute this data well, which is, you know, we ended up with a few outside the FDA range. Again, if we target the low 70s, sometimes we will hit the 60s, no matter what our efforts is. But this data was well distributed. There, there is some missing data here where the band of pulse oximeter dropout. Um, and it reports the mean bias um, within each range. And also in the, the 70 to 100% range is the overall FDA range. Um, the standard error, I include the 95% confidence limits. I put in here basically everything that anyone has ever requested. The limits of agreement, again, adjusted to the repeated measures, maximum, minimum, and the root mean square error. One of the things you will see is the root mean square error is higher. It's over the 3% of the 70 to 80%. But again, this can also just be that due to the noise of biological data and the quality of the plateaus. Uh, this is not a, unusual. This is one of our reference oximeters for a 12 uh, study subject study. Uh, 2.24 is overall well within the 3% error range and uh, again represents good performance of the, the reference oximeter. And this is important. Uh, one of the things we realized, uh, Mike Bernstein uh, mentioned that we had issues that were a little slow to pick up on one of our, um, our um, ABL 90s was a little off. And we noticed uh, that the, the reference oximeters were not performing well, and this was one of the clues. Since it didn't really tell us uh, performance, we now have multiple devices, so we can do a duplicate and triplicate. Um, and then we also supply bland, modified bland almond plots. Um, and, and this is a plot of the bias versus the SAO2. And the SAO2 is a standard bland almond plot, usually uses the average of two devices. Um, because SIO2 is a 
gold standard, although imperfect, um, it is plotted in the x-axis. And I think this better shows the change of bias of the saturation, much better than correlation plots. Correlation plots create a lot of white space, so it essentially compresses everything. You don't see it well. We can also show the individual subjects separately, and we can also show the mean bias limits of agreement on the plot. This is, um, this is a classic plot of the, uh, the reference null core oximeter for 12 subjects. And the dashed lines are the limits of agreement. And you can see um, outlier here. And I can tell you, having looked it up, this was a, uh, a black male uh, who was a Fitzpatrick six showing some classic bias, uh, positive bias. And again, this is what we found. And again, Schoding really essentially confirmed our results in a clinical study. Um, Again, this positive bias which shows uh, shows up. So again, we could see our outlier here identifying them um, and its characteristics. I'm also showing the um, the regression line here, which is pulled upwards probably by this individual. And again, even in a 12 subject, it's going to come up again as we discuss power. Uh, the p value for this regression line, which is a accounted for repeated measures is p less than 0. 0.0001. This is, uh, again, the robustness of repeated measures uh, with this type of data. <coughs> These two studies, um, we report things a little bit differently. The FDA so far has not required 95% confidence limits on uh, certain of the data. Uh, this is challenging. Reporting a 95% confidence limit on the ARMS and limits of agreement, that's like reporting a standard deviation on a standard deviation, okay? But it can be done with by bootstrapping, which is a very effective measure. Um, and in research studies, uh, we are in fact then making statistical comparisons. The statistical comparisons we can make um, include over SAO2 as a continuous variable, like that regression line. Also within the decadal levels that, that we use for FDA testing, we have gender, skin, perfusion index and motion. Um, and then we have interaction, confounding. A 12 subject study can show differences in perfusion index between men and women, and that's not a repeated measure. Uh, and so they are interrelated, uh, which even brings up the issue is, is, is there worse performance for, um, for gender with pulse oximeters? Um, we have, again, it's important to really recognize what repeated measures we have and, and how we can leverage this, um, and, and that is an SAO2 motion and perfusion index. Uh, Dr. Victor reported our study that we use kind of big data where we had the same subject coming back in multiple days, and based on, you know, the cold weather in San Francisco over the summer, we sometimes have them with much lower perfusion. Other days, they come in much warmer. And that type of repeated measures data is extremely robust, whereas gender and skin are not repeated measures. Um, so we end up with repeated measures over SAO2. I showed you that P less than 0. 0.0001 of the regression line. We can find statistical significance on a 12 subject study that is often not clinically significant. And, and we sometimes try to emphasize that in some of these studies, even though it's P less than 0. 0.0001, this may represent a difference in pulse oximeter values of only a couple percent between 70% and 100%. And that's important to recognize how robust repeated measures is. Um, and this is an example of a research table where this is just a reference from our motion study. And we, you can see the difference if we report the absolute bias, uh, the precision, and the root mean square error here, which I do report with 95% confidence limits, which I think is ideal. Same thing for the uh, limits of agreement. And depending on uh, the reviewer for a manuscript, this may or may not be asked for, but I think probably is worth learning how to do statistically. So far, the FDA has not asked for that. Um, I also uh, want to emphasize uh, we see for operator characteristic curves for people who are not as familiar with those. Um, I teach this to our residents all the time. It, it's a natural result when the expert. That wasn't good. I just muted him by accident. Unmute him. <laughs>
Sorry, that was my mistake. Can somebody unmute Mike or John? Anybody out there? Muted the room. Okay. Let, there we go. Let let go of your regulatory pistol. Oh. Uh, I, I heard bottles and cans opening, so I was trying to fix that, but my mistake. Sorry. <laughs> well, maybe it, it may be a different time in your zone, and it may be time for certain bottles. But, um, but I, I want to emphasize the importance of ROC curves. The, the clinical question: If you have a patient who is, is moving and you're concerned with a hypoxia, the real question is. Is, is their oxygen saturation 92% or 93%? It's really, do they need intervention? And are they hypoxic or not? This also may apply to carboxyhemoglobin for the accuracy, uh, maybe not nearly as good, but you really may be trying to identify people who can go home or people who really need further workup. And it overall describes sensitivity and specificity, uh, but the area of the curve really describes the overall performance of the device whereas greater than 0.9 would really be considered excellent. Um, and you can also determine a threshold for this. Um, and this is uh, what we uh, published for our motion study, where you can see that uh, the reference has an area of it, uh, the receiver operator curve essentially of one. Um, it really completely accurately identifies who's hypoxic. Not. And even with motion, even though the accuracy was substantially degraded, the, the area of the curve was still very, very high. Uh, and uh, but yet, there, there were some differences. And what usually we would expect with this for a uh, darker skin subject is not necessarily that the area of the curve is so poor, but that the, the threshold has shifted, that, that anyone under 93% you may need to think about as potentially hypoxic as compared to 93% saturation on the pulse oximeter versus um, under 90% for someone who is not dark skin. The, the low area of the curve of the Schoening, uh, Schoening study probably represents um, real world noisier data in, in that certain. So it's important to think about this. What it, a receiver operator characteristic curve represents and why you may want one. Uh, I'm going to briefly mention sample size. I believe Gene is going to talk about that uh, more. This, could be, this is something we're discussing. Uh, classically, Mark Twain actually attributed this to Benjamin Disraeli, although from what I can understand, no one's ever found evidence that Benjamin Disraeli came up with this. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. I, you know, sometimes that would add accounting, but in this case, power analysis, since a lot of people publish studies and then, then do the power analysis afterwards to try to prove their study was, was adequately powered. Um, but there's a lot of issues in terms of the discussion of increasing um, the sample size and why we might do that. And I think it's important to recognize that there really may be two different reasons for increasing the sample size. One would be to really refining uh, how good an estimate you have of descriptive statistics, and that would represent by the 95% confidence limits. Um, there's, there's much more fun ringtones than that. Um, the, um, and it, you know, we, we showed you an example of, of a dark skin subject whose wound mean square error might be well over three. And, and, and if you had a couple bad study subjects, if you had a small sample size, you might not have good data based on that. So it does refine uh, the precision of which you've estimated a lot of your descriptive statistics. And then it will increase the power of comparisons. Um, and that might be in, in skin color and other comparisons like gender. But in order to do that, we would really need to decide ahead of time um, what is a clinically significant difference that we could need to measure. Um, you know, clearly, if there's a 10% difference in bias, that's important. If it's 1%, maybe, maybe not. Um, although I think that uh, Dr. Schoening pointed out that we may need to consider this a little further in terms of how it affects the, the table. There's a substantial cost of increasing the sample size um, for people performing these studies. And right now, in terms of even getting these studies done, so this can represent a, a barrier. So I think uh, I've shown you the repeated measures. We have incredible robust data over uh, over even 12 subjects. Um, I look at this in terms of 
uh, study days. We on average do about six study subjects a day. So uh, a standard 12 sub subject uh, study would be two days. If you, depending on how much you increase the required sample size, this could be multiple more days of studies, maybe just one more, maybe even just adding a subject per day. So I think it's important before we even consider what the power is, it's the question we're answering by power, which is what is an important clinically significant difference that we would need the power for? Um, you know, if it's if it's two percent, it, it, and again it depends on the distribution of your data, you might still be able to find it. Um, but I think that's a key question as we start to look at some of the discussion of sample slides and power. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, stop the share. Yeah, I've got, I've got my, my tech manager. I'm actually pretty technically good here. Um, <laughs> but then I get distracted by actually doing this. Um, up next is going to be Dr. Jean Pinello, who I, I've been interacting with. And it's wonderful since I, I get to learn a lot from people who are much better at uh, statistics than I am. I'm self taught. Uh, Dr. Pinello is a senior mathematical statistician at the FDA. Um, and he covers imaging, diagnostics, software reliability. He was before that the team leader uh, in the Division of Biostatistics, provided support for the evaluation of other di diagnostic devices, including in vitro diagnostic test kits, monitoring diagnostic imaging systems. Um, he has a PhD in biostats, um, and he is much better than I am. Um, so hopefully, I can get to learn from him. Unfortunately, I was hoping he'd get here in real life, but I think he's on Zoom. and. Dr. Nick is going to switch over. Gene, can you hear us? If you want to go ahead and share your screen. Thank you, John. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, and, and I want to thank Dr. Lipnick and ISO and UCSF for inviting me to speak. I'm grateful for that. I'm let's see. I have a number of slides, but um, I may just focus on the study design issues for control desaturation studies. Um, let's see. Uh, so there are clinical performance studies um, of, of measurement procedures. Uh, there, there can be accuracy study, which is and accuracy is defined as agreement of the measurement with a reference standard, which determines the true value of the measure end. But there also could be agreement studies, and that's agreement of the measurement with a non-reference standard. And what do I mean by reference standard? What's well, the best available method for assessing um, the measure end, or if it's a diagnostic, the target condition. And a gold standard is an error-free reference standard, which we often don't have. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit in a few slides later, um, two different types of study, study designs for accuracy study. The conventional design where we have the SPO2 and the SAO2 for every, every subject, and then a hybrid design um, using what's called a transfer standard. And I'll also talk a little bit about agreement studies. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the um, options for statistical analysis. So, and, you know, what brought us all here is the, is the possibility that um, there may be differences in bias of the pulse oximeter across different skin color groups. And ITA has one measurement of skin color and you could bend it into six groups as it's done here in Delbino et al. And you could compare those groups to, for differences in bias. And uh, this is an analysis of some data on this transfer standard and two other pulse oximeters comparing three different groups of ITA. And, and the third one here, I hope you can see my cursor, um, the, the difference in bias between ITA 5.6 versus ITA 1.2 has a p-value of 0.04 um, and the estimate is 0.8 minus a minus two, so it's about a 1% bias, which seems to be statistically significant here. And this accounts for repeated measures in this data set. Um, but what can we do? We, we can do analysis of variance, like we just what I just showed there illustrated to see if there's any differences in bias between the 
skin color groups. And then uh, if we do see that this null hypothesis of no difference in bias uh, can be rejected, then we can do we can look at pairwise comparisons to see whether there are differences between the individual pairwise uh, comparison groups. Uh, we can also get a little more power out of this by doing an what's called analysis of covariance. So we adjust these comparisons of the groups, these BIs, which I'm are denoting the biases for covariates, and an obvious covariate is SAO2. Um, but perfusion could go in there too. And um, let me just illustrate that in a later slide. So this, so this is an analysis of covariance of some data. This is actually real world data from Edmire et al. And um, so we got three skin color groups according to the Fitzpatrick, um, Fitzpatrick uh, six categories that are grouped into three groups light, medium, and dark. And, but we're also ad adjusting for probe location and then whether the hands are cool or not, which is like a surrogate for perfusion. And uh, and also SAO2. And so we do this analysis, we see that, and look on, on the right side of the, the ANOVA table here, the, the skin color groups are have a significantly, um, the bias between them is significantly different. The F ratio is very large, the p-value is Essentially zero, and and uh, but also perfusion. This this cool hands versus not is also has a p value less than 0 0.05. So that's suggestive that uh, there is a difference in bias between whether your hands are cool or not. Um, now ITA is a continuous variable, so we don't have to necessarily bin and look at groups of ITA, we could use we could look to see whether there's a linear or some other trend in bias across continuous ITA, which I'm denoting here ITA C. Use in, in this case, um, the null hypothesis is there's no linear trend versus the alternative is that there is a linear trend and it should be more powerful than analysis of variance. Um, and there's and it, an option that's in between that is a trend test. So you could you could assume that there's a monotone increase uh, across the groups in bias and do, and then because you're specifying that alternative, you can do what's called a trend test, which has should have more power than the analysis of variance, but maybe less power than the regression. Um, and now you don't have to, for the continuous analysis of ITA, you don't have to stop at linear uh, regression models. You could do what's called a low S um, uh, smoothing regression, which is like a linear, uh, local linear smoothing technique. So what I'm doing here is I've, I've looked at um, um, a finger clip device and these are 19 patients and looking at the difference between SPO2 and SAO2 and um, doing a, a low S smoothing of these points and, and it's for different locations. Um, and there's, there's a pair of plots uh, in each column on whether it's a low S or a robust low S, but you could, so the first, the, the left-hand side is the forehead and the middle is ventral forearm left and uh, the right is ventral forearm right. But I think there's a pattern here where you can see that th there isn't much bias uh, until ITA gets low enough, then it starts to turn up. And so we could actually, you know, with this low S linear smoothing technique or local linear smoothing technique, we could, we could look for um, change points at which the bias starts to um, starts to become different. And uh, this is the fingernail bed and the fingers soft right index finger um, for which there wasn't much variation in ITA and earlobe right back and right front. So I had many of those, but an, another useful um, visual assessment I think is the quantile quantile plot because it 
And this is graphing the quantiles of or percentiles of SpO2 against the same corresponding quantile or percentile in SaO2. And what that does for you is allow you to look for bias anywhere along the measuring uh, interval. So in these data, we've got, uh, this is the overall quantile quantile plot for three different uh, pulse oximeter devices. And um, the scatter is pretty close to the identity line, which means there isn't a whole lot bias overall. And this is for Fitzpatrick. This is stratified, you know, so I'm stratifying that, that data now uh, into Fitzpatrick one through four, which doesn't look like there's too much bias going on, maybe a little positive at the low end for the forehead sensor on the left. But there's definite um, pattern of positive bias for Fitzpatrick five, six. And it it isn't constant. It's It, it seems to get larger as... SAO2 gets lower, and, and um, the reason I advocate this is, uh, um, you know, there is also, there is something called regression to the mean that I'm going to, if I have time, talk about, but that the quantile quantile plot is a pure assessment of bias that's not conflated with regression toward the mean, which is just a phenomenon due to variation between the variables it isn't a, it isn't biased but it um so i think this is a more uh, trustworthy evaluation of, of uh, bias now for the accuracy study getting back to that the conventional design is uh, you know where you everybody has a blood draw to get their sao2 that is paired with the SpO2 from the pulse oximeter, and you have repeated measures on that. And I did, uh, based on some data, um, I did some sample size calculations depending on whether we had two skin color groups or three skin color groups or six skin color groups. And looking at uh, getting, you know, having the sample size to detect a difference in bias between those groups, assuming that there are differences in bias, which is this uh, third or actually fourth column here is the assumptions on the differences in bias where the, so like for the forehand sensor with two groups, first row here, the difference in bias is 1% because um, in the second group that the bias is 1% greater than the first. That's how you, that's, that's how you can read this table here. And for this finger clip, for example, in the highlighted in yellow, the sample size I get is uh, 30 subjects, assuming that there are about 23 repeated measures per subject, and assuming the equal allocation of subjects to the skin to the groups. These are skin color groups that we're thinking about. So 15 each in the lighter skin and the darker skin group. And this will give you 80% power to detect a 1% difference in bias between the groups. But it also gives, it's the same sample size um, obtains when, you, when you're trying to show, for example, that there's, the difference in bias is no worse than 2% when the true difference is 1%. And why is that? Because the difference between the no value of one and the alternative of two is 1% as well as, so it's the same effect size. And so we can, we, um, there are different hypotheses that would yield the same number of subjects. And uh, so 30 subjects might be a lot. It's more than what we, what the typical pre-market study uh, has contained. So typically there have been like 12 subjects. So a number of us were thinking of a, another possible design and we're calling it the hybrid design where you have maybe only 15 subjects on which you have the blood draw SAO2 value and the pulse oximeter SPO2 value, but you also have a third measurement as what could be called a silver standard. And this could be this transfer standard um, that is supposed to be a highly accurate well calibrated pulse oximeter, or it could be some other cleared FDA, uh, FDA cleared pulse oximeter, for example, but it's some comparator here and uh, 
and and there's another set of N2 subjects on which you don't require the blood draws. All you have is that SpO2 for the device under study, the pulse oximeter under study, and then the silver standard. And why is this helpful? Well, we can learn um, from the first N1 subjects what the how to predict the SaO2 from the silver standard and the SpO2, and and so we can use that joint distribution to predict the missing SaO2 values in the second set of subjects and uh, using the predictive distribution. That's, so this is the idea. And this is a depiction of it. So you have two variables where you have complete data and then the third, which you don't have complete data. So, and that's the SAO2. We only have complete data on maybe on 15 subjects, but maybe you have another 30 subjects on which you have just the silver standard and the SPO2. Um, and it's potentially less burdensome because you don't need 30 subjects on on which you which you have to draw blood to get the SAO2. You only require 15. But you need the sample size for N2 to be large enough so that um, so that the effective sample size of the study is just is is equal to or greater than the sample size of the conventional study. In other words, this effective sample size has to be at least 30. And there are ways to calculate that. And the key to study success here is that this silver standard has to add value over the pulse oximeter SpO2 um, in predicting the SaO2. Otherwise, uh, that second part of the study, the N2 subjects are not going to be helpful at all. Um, and so this is an example of this. Um, where we had 15 subjects. This is a simulation based on some real data. And uh, we're looking at differences in uh, bias between two skin color groups. And um, the S0 line is just having the N115 subjects, sorry, and, no, and calculating the uh, estimated difference in bias, 2.4 and the confidence interval. This is a Bayesian analysis. Um, and the next three lines are simulations in which we have 30 subjects and two subjects on which we have missing SAO2 values because we didn't, we didn't take the blood draws. So the total sample size is 45. But the effective sample size for these three simulations is 31, 31 and a half, 34.6, according to the calculation. So, so we've actually gained from the second and, you know, these N2 subjects, we've gained 16, 16 and a half and 19.6 subjects on which to estimate the accuracy and these confidence intervals become narrower. So it, it, um, it, it, it was successful in, in extracting extra information from the, the subject, the N2 subjects. So this is this might be a viable way to go forward to get more information in a less burdensome way. Now we could just consider an agreement study. Maybe you know have the device being compared against that transfer standard, silver standard. Um, now, agreement of a device measurement with a non-reference method is not an evaluation of device accuracy. Um, however, if the device agrees highly with that non-reference method across the entire measure and interval, then one can infer that the device and the non-reference method may have similar accuracy without having to know what the accuracy is because they agree so well to each other. But that's probably, that may not happen very often in practice because the non-reference method has intrinsic error, which may propagate as disagreement with the device unless they're very, very highly correlated. Um, and if they don't agree highly, then we don't know which, whether the device or the non-reference method has better accuracy. We just don't know much with this type of agreement study. And, and for diagnostics, uh, the FDA doesn't allow uh, 
because agreement studies are not accuracy studies, we don't allow um, labels like sensitivity or specificity. We call them positive and negative percent agreement because they're really not statements of accuracy. Um, and so I, I just very quickly, there's a uh, clinical endpoints, there's biomarkers, there's surrogate endpoints, which are intended to substitute for clinical endpoints. And there's something related called an intermediate endpoint that's not the ultimate outcome, but could be helpful in a study. And for the hybrid study, I would consider this silver standard, transfer standard as an intermediate endpoint. In an agreement study where you're actually using, you know, the transfer standard as the, as the, as the comparator, it's really a surrogate endpoint, and surrogate endpoints are in general very difficult to validate. So I, I don't know whether that's a, a path forward. And these are some references on that. Um, I could keep going, but maybe um, I probably used up all my time. I don't know. Does anybody know how, how long I've gone? I don't think anyone's going to say damn lie, but uh, <laughs> that was great, Gene. Okay. All right. Gene, how Gene, much I more do you I, have? I, I think, have, if, yeah, if he's got a few more slides, because I know he's got different suggestions on how he maybe should be reporting performance. Yeah. And I think that's you know, like front and center of what we're trying to figure out. So yeah. I think we should um, give him a few more minutes. Sounds good. Gene, keep going. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to overstep my time, but so. And John already talked about these performance uh, metrics. Um, there's some others. Uh, the mean absolute deviation is the mean of the absolute value of the difference between the SPO2 and SAO2. There's, and I would, uh, this total deviation index and its, and its uh, com companion, the coverage probability, I think are could be very useful metrics too. Um, that, but so, and and I think a coverage interval can be a very clinically useful interval. This is, you know, an interval within which the true value of, you know, X here, which is the SAO2 will lie with a stated probability. Um, so this has to do with this literature on measurement uncertainty. And, um, this, you know, make under some assumptions, you, the coverage intervals are available based on these accuracy summaries. So for example, for ARMS, the, the probability that SAO2 is within this SPO2 plus or minus ARMS is 68% under these assumptions. And you could turn around the limits of agreement into a coverage interval as well. And I, you know, having an interval within which, you know, that contains the plausible values for SAO2 could I, I think could be helpful for the user rather than just taking the SPO2 at, at face value and not considering measurement uncertainty. And uh, I think that probably the best way to do this is what's called inverse prediction uh, based on a regression uh, to get that coverage interval. And I won't go into that, but these are some references on measurement uncertainty. And um, you can disaggregate accuracy into bias and imprecision. And, and John talked about that. Uh, and, um, you know, I can tell you for diagnostics, like if you want to diagnose, diagnose hypoxemia with a pulse oximeter, it's the imprecision is what's really important. You know, if you're, if you're very precise and you have some bias, you can always move that cutoff and get great diagnostic accuracy. But if, if, if there's a lot of variation, if you, um, that's what counts. Uh, in terms of not being able to, to be diagnostically accurate. And what I have seen in more than one data set is if you break up the arms into precision and bias, the bias is worse in darker, um, on, in darker skin subjects. As you can see here in, in, in all three of these uh, devices, but the precision and I, it turns out to be better uh, in in the darker skin subjects. And I, you know, I don't I don't know why. There's a reason, you know, why why would this would be so? But um, 
if you, and then I plotted the ROC plots and I'm getting better uh, ROC plots for darker skin than lighter skin. This is, this is a controlled desaturation study. And, uh, and why is it, in fact, it's, it's not just good, it's perfect uh, for the darker skin subjects. In fact, actually every, everybody's excellent. Uh, the, the lighter skin is also excellent, but there's, there's the SpO2 distributions for hypoxemic and non-hypoxemic are completely separated. That's why the ROC is perfect. So if you choose the right cutoff, you, you get perfect sensitivity and specificity. And I saw this also in the Ebmeyer Werewolf study data, um, which I think is a, a good study because um, the, the measurements were simultaneous. And um, there are many limitations with real world group comparisons. Uh, the occult hypoxemia rate depends highly on the prevalence of hypoxemia. And um, um, Dr. Shodin acknowledged that. Uh, the box plot has a similar problem. It's, it's highly dependent on the distribution of SAO2 in the groups. And in, you know, in real world studies, you could get, the distributions of SA2 could be very different between the groups that you're comparing. And that may be a reason why we're seeing very different patterns in these box plots, depending on whether it's real world versus um, a controlled desatur desaturation study where by design, the distribution of SAO2 is going to be about the same in every subject. Um, and so if I were gonna make those comparisons, I would weight the observations so that the groups have the same SAO2 distribution. Uh, otherwise, I'm not, I'm not sure how to interpret those box plots. And finally, there's regression to the mean, which I alluded to before. Um, this is a an exercise I did in which I just randomly permuted the labels of SAO2 and SpO2 in the data set. So there can't be any bias. It's impossible to have, you know, and so the quantile quantile plot shows this is right on the identity line. But if you do the regression, you can see that for lower values of SAO2 tend to be accompanied by higher values of SpO2 and vice versa on the high end. This is not a bias. This is pure regression to the mean. And I think everyone should be cognizant of that. You can it, it actually the regression line can be decomposed as bias and regression to the mean. This is the modified Bland Altman plot. The red line is bias, and then this regression line is in purple. And uh, the regression of the mean effect is actually the bias minus the regression line. So, um, and I instead of being instead of doing this. In, with linear um, regression, I I did a low S on the on the quantile plot, and it, for this device, for some reason, it's negatively biased. Um, but uh, so the orange line is this bias line, and then the, I did a low S on the on on the on the regression. So we don't have to rely on assuming linearity, and you can see that. You know, the difference between bias and regression is when they're crossing here in this middle range, there's there's no regression to the mean effect. But once you go beyond about 98, you get, um, you know, a negative regression towards the mean. And then if, once you go below about 96, you get um, a positive regression toward the mean. And, I'm, and the reason I'm presenting this, and I hope people could consider this, I think we need to understand, you know, the data a little more deeper than we have. Uh, otherwise, um, uh, we're at risk of misinterpreting data. And uh, my suggestions are to account for measurement uncertainty, provide a coverage interval of plausible SAO2 values, given the observed SPO2 value, and be cognizant of regression to the mean and to account for SpO2 bias, be, you know, in clinical practice, I think you gotta be prepared to move that SpO2 hypoxemia threshold accordingly. And if, and if there, you, you know that you have a population with a high pretest probability or prevalence of hypoxemia, I would not use the pulse oximeter rule out hypoxemia because the occult hypoxemia rate would be too high. And the, so these are suggestions from a statistician who's not a clinician or doesn't know the technology, but I, this is um, 
I hope you find it helpful nonetheless. Thanks a lot.